So this lecture, New Perspectives from the Integrated Systems Model for Treating Women with Pelvic Girdle Pain, Urinary Incontinence, Pelvic Organ Prolapse, and Diastasis, is a lecture I put together this summer for the Associ Associated Charter of Physiotherapists and Women's Health for a conference in Bristol uh, last September. I also presented it again for the Icelandic Physiotherapy Association. And the key message from this lecture is that for all of these conditions, we have to look beyond the pelvic floor. And I wanted to share with the physiotherapists my experience in using the integrated systems model approach for treating these conditions and to discuss a common feature amongst them. So why talk about women with all these conditions? Many, many people, many physios say, well, I don't treat incontinence or pelvic organ prolapse. We leave that to the pelvic floor therapist. Well, in fact, if you treat women, you are likely treating women with these conditions. Because as we'll see in a moment, over 50% of the women you see over the age of 45 or 50 do have either asymptomatic or symptomatic uh, issues with their continence mechanisms and their pelvic organ uh, support. And they may not just not be telling you about it. So if you treat women, you are treating these conditions. So why? Well, most women have kids, and pregnancy and delivery presents huge challenges to the trunk. And when your trunk is challenged, so too is your whole body. And pregnancy and delivery, as we know, are also risk factors for pelvic girdle pain, urinary incontinence, organ prolapse, and diastasis rectus abdominis, for sure. So how common uh, is pregnancy-related pelvic girdle pain? It's really difficult to determine from the literature because often um, researchers will combine both low back and pelvic girdle pain and it's long been recognized that uh, these are two very different animals. Now, Wu did a systematic review in 2004 and showed that 45% of women have combined low back and pelvic girdle pain during their pregnancies, and 25% of these persist postpartum. Now, these numbers drop by 25% during pregnancy when only severe pain is considered. And this number is consistent with the findings of Hannah Albert, um, who showed that 20% 20, 20 of a large number of, of pregnant women suffered enough to seek medical help. So one in five of women through pregnancy are going to have enough uh, significant pain or problems to seek medical care. But most of them get better. Only 5 to 7% fail to recover. And these are the 5 to 7% that we want to pick up in our screening programs. Well, what about urinary incontinence? Pregnancy-related urinary incontinence is extremely common. For women in their first pregnancy, 48% will have some issues with continence. 85% of those who are multiparous, in other words, that had more than one child, or this is their second or more pregnancy. Postpartum, these numbers get really scary. 92% of those that are still incontinent at 12 weeks will still be incontinent at 5 years. Thus, the question needs to be asked with all your postpartum women whether or not they're having any issues with their continence mechanism because it's so common. 5 to 7 years after delivery, again, here's this close to 50% number, 44.6% of women have some degree of incontinence. Now, it's not just a condition that is exclusive to pregnancy. Naliparous elite athletes, 28% across the board, across all sports, will have some issues with leakage in their sport. Gymnasts and trampolinists, um, by far, are the highest percentage. And it's a condition that appears to worsen as we age. In fact, incontinence is the second most common reason after dementia for being admitted into assisted living. So are we depressed yet? Now, the risk factors and prevalence for pelvic organ prolapse, again, here comes this one and two number. 50% of Paris women have some degree of symptomatic or asymptomatic loss of pelvic organ support, which is why I say if you're treating women who've had children, regardless of their complaint, whether it's headache, uh, back pain, shoulder pain, um, one out of two of them will have some degree of pelvic organ prolapse and or urinary incontinence. It also tends to get worse as we age, and 50% of women who have a surgical repair will experience a recurrence, which tells you that the uh, cause for the problem is not likely being treated merely with surgery. 30% of those who have um, surgery will have a second one within two years. Risk factors for losing your organ support are vaginal delivery, which increases the risk fourfold. 
And if you have two or more vaginal deliveries, it increases the risk by eight and a half. Forceps delivery, 53% of women who are delivered by forceps have major defects in the pelvic floor muscles. Um, uh, denervation of the levator ani, if the levator ani is not innervated, then the muscular support to the fascial system that supports the pelvic organ, organs becomes compromised. Hysterectomy is a risk factor for uh, POP. And this one's interesting, an excessive thoracic kyphosis. And we could hypothesize on what the impact of losing your thoracic support could be on uh, pelvic organ support for, for hours. Now, the relationship between pelvic girdle pain and incontinence has also been studied. Um, Michelle Smith looked at the Australian longitudinal study on women's health, very large number of women, 28,000 women surveyed, and found that pregnant women experience more back pain than non-pregnant women, which makes sense, and also experience more incontinence. And in a smaller study, Annalise Poulgutzvard um, showed that 52%, common number, hey, 52% report a combination of low back and pelvic girdle pain, as well as pelvic floor dysfunction, which was defined as incontinence, sexual dysfunction, and or constipation. Teresa Spitznagel from Chicago showed that 66% of women with a diastasis had at least one support-related pelvic floor dysfunction. So what causes uh, pregnancy-related pain, incontinence, and uh, POP? Well, we really feel that it's the failure to regain optimal strategies for transferring loads and that what happens through your pregnancy and after the del delivery in terms of how you transfer loads between your thorax and your pelvis can change dramatically. And the reasons why are multiple. Number one, there can be damage or injury or strain to the joints of the pelvis, pubic symphysis, sacroiliac joints, and the ligaments that support them. More commonly, there can be dyssynergies or loss of optimal sequencing and timing or changes in motor control, which is a neural system impairment in both the abdominal wall and the pelvic floor. In addition, there can be changes in the visceral support system uh, for both the bladder and the uterus. It amazes me actually that the uterus can grow to the size of a full-term fetus and then after delivery, shrink back down and be expected to land in its normal, aligned, balanced tensegrity position with uh, spooning the bladder with equal tension in the cardinal, uterosacral, and, and broad ligaments. And you can see here on this picture, this ultrasound picture on the right, that the dense structure on the bottom is the uterus and um, it is displaced relative to the bladder. Now, there's uh, a lot of reasons it could be over there. It could be merely a poor imaging technique, but if the Im imaging technique is accurate, then this reflects that the uterus and the is not sitting centered to the bladder. And you can actually feel this through the abdomen as the picture on the left is showing there. And finally, there can be compromise to the myofascial system, uh, in particularly the uh, linea alba, the uh, anterior abdominal wall, as well as the endopelvic fascia of the pelvic floor. So there's a number of reasons why um, women may have non-optimal strategies after the trauma that is induced both during the pregnancies and delivery. And common across all of these presentations is the loss of function of the muscles of the trunk. And this is including, but certainly not limited to, the, the pelvic floor. So if we look a little bit more closely at the pelvic floor, because the, this lecture was initially presented at a conference of pelvic floor therapists, um, the pelvic floor has multiple functions. It's involved in voiding, defecation, sexual arousal, pelvic organ support, and also involved in movement control or stability of the pelvis, in that these muscles work synergistically with the deep abdominals and the diaphragm to provide control to the joints of the pelvis lumbar spine and also indirectly to the low thoracic rings, and it's through multiple mechanism, mechanisms that uh, control is achieved. Now, in order to have optimal function of the pelvic floor, this requires that not only that the anatomy be intact, but there be optimal sequencing and timing of contraction of both the superficial and deep muscles of the pelvic floor, the urogenital diaphragm, as well as the levator ani, as well as adequate strength and endurance. So there's two component parts to optimal function of the floor in addition to its intact anatomy, and that is motor control and performance. And it can be specific to the task that's being assessed. 
Pelvic floor muscle training is recommended as the first line treatment for women with all forms of incontinence as well as pelvic organ prolapse. But what is the best way to train or to restore optimal function to the pelvic floor muscles? This is my question. But first of all, before we go into optimal uh, strategies for training, what do, what do, do women with all these conditions present with on clinical evaluation? Well, Bump has shown that 25 to 40 percent of women have a decreased cortical awareness of where their floor is or even what a proper contraction of the pelvic floor is and will often attempt a valsalva instead of a pelvic floor contraction. So what does an optimal pelvic floor contraction look like? Well, this is an ultrasound image up here on the left. And when the pelvic floor contracts optimally, it is thought that we should see a midline lift of the bladder. This is a parasagittal view here. And again, you see a nice lift, the bottom of the bladder. And when we look at the uh, pelvic organs from a perineal view, this is the anal rectal angle here, this curve. And in an optimal contraction, contraction there should be a cranial and ventral lift of the pelvic organs along a trajectory towards the, the neck of the urethra. So that's optimal. So number one, women with uh, pain, incontinence, and prolapse often uh, do a valsalva or uh, have a non-optimal trajectory uh, of that lift. And alternately, they may contract, so you may be able to feel internally a contraction but not see a lift of the levator plate. And so on ultrasound, this would look like nothing is happening. Others with incontinence have a good lift, but they're still incontinent. So how relevant is the lift to the continence mechanism anyway? When your pelvic floor muscles are hypertonic, as is quite common with incontinence, this lift may be restricted because the floor may be already lifted. In other words, its starting position may be already there. So you may not see anything on the ultrasound because it's already at its highest point. The pelvic floor muscles in these women may be able to contract, but if there is a tear in the pelvic floor, as is very common in a first vaginal delivery, they may not be able to generate the fascial tension necessary to facilitate closure um, of the urethra and support of the pelvic organs and the bones of the pelvis. Now finally, many uh, women with these conditions present with asymmetry of activation or timing. And this is what I want to focus on for the rest of this paper. This is what interests me, is when there are left-right differences in activation of the pelvic floor or front-back differences. And this is the T in Joe Laycock's perfect scheme. And is what I want to focus on because I really wonder and think, in fact, that the integrated systems model can help um, facilitate pelvic floor muscle retraining for women across the board, for women who have a multitude of complaints, um, including pelvic girdle pain, incontinence, and prolapse. The integrated systems model certainly helped guide the research in uh, those with diastasis rectus abdominis, which I'll share with you in the second part of this paper. And I want to illustrate the integrated systems model through a case report, but, but first, before we do that, a, a couple of things to, to share with you. Key things to know. First of all, the nerve supply for the abdominal wall, including um, transversus abdominis, is from T7 to T11, the lower thoracic rings. Uh, comes from the lower intercostal nerves, as well as the iliohypogastric and ilioinguinal nerves. So, Altered function of the lower thorax can impact neural drive or sequencing and timing of the abdominal wall. We know that coactivation of the pelvic floor and transversus occurs in healthy subjects. And when the deep and superficial muscle systems are working synergistically as they should, loads are transferred optimally through the trunk, which means there's no loss of joint control in the thorax, the lumbar spine, or the pelvis. In other words, there's no failed load transfer. When you have an optimal strategy, you'll have optimal alignment, biomechanics, and control. And we call this optimal ABCs. And that's what we're looking for when we're assessing the whole body in any one task in the integrated systems model. Now, this synergy of activation of transversus in the pelvic floor is commonly lost in subjects with urinary incontinence. Now, women with incontinence and pelvic girdle pain often will use a pattern of chest gripping or bracing 
or overactivation of the superficial oblique abdominals. And this has been documented during the active straight leg raise task by Darren Beals and Pete O'Sullivan. And they found that this chest gripping strategy will increase the intra-abdominal pressure, pressure and depress the pelvic floor or the levator plate. And this was part of Darren Beal's uh, PhD study. So the clinical translation from all of this is that during loading tasks, when the strategy is non-optimal, the deep muscle system fails to control joint motion and the potential exists for loss of um, urethral and pelvic organ support. And where many women are going after having their babies um, to get back into shape after delivery is not to the physiotherapy clinic, but they're actually going to boot camp, to yoga, and to Pilates. And while there may be nothing wrong with that, it's definitely a problem if this is the strategy that they're using when they're doing double leg lift loading. So note the bulging in the midline of this gal's abdomen when she lifts both legs. Clearly, the deep system is not working well because when the deep system works well, the abdomen should hollow. The navel should draw towards the spine. It shouldn't bulge or dome like this. Okay? So this gal is really at risk for uh, incontinence and prolapse because the pressures continually drive the organs in a caudal direction. Now, finally, the uh, research also shows that motor control changes are variable across patients with pain, incontinence, and prolapse. And specific to low back pain, we know that often the deep muscles are compromised. They don't come on when they should. Sometimes they don't come on at all. Um, and the sequencing and timing can often be off. So in incontinence, uh, in one study was shown that there is a delay in the activation of the urogenital diaphragm. Whereas in continent women, the diaphragm, urogenital diaphragm came on first, followed by the levator ani. Whereas in incontinent women, there was a, a reversal of activation. In addition, other muscles become augmented or early to come on. And these are often the superficial muscles, particularly in the abdominal wall and in the, in, in the low back or in the, in the spine, not just in the low back, but in, in the back itself. Now also, the deep muscles can be augmented, but most often it's the superficial ones. The strategies people use for tasks are highly individual. In other words, just because you have back pain doesn't mean you're all going to activate your external oblique and inhibit your transversus. The strategies are quite individual. They're task-specific. In other words, you do different things for different tasks, and there's lots of variability in terms of which muscles are involved. So there isn't a recipe for any of this. The common link is that the strategy is non-optimal for the task. And remember, a non-optimal strategy is one where there's non-optimal alignment, biomechanics, and or control. So the key message with all of this is that we need to assess the individual patient, that we can't look at group data, that it's individual patient data that is relevant, the person in front of you. We can't predict what pain is going to do we can't predict which impairments are going to cause pain, incontinence, prolapse, or a diastasis for that matter. So how do we put all this together to, in order to be able to understand where to treat the person in front of us? The Integrated Systems Model for Disability and Pain, or the ISM as it's known for short, was developed from a collaboration between myself and Linda Joy Lee over the last decade. And what we tried to do over the last few years is, in fact, to develop a classification scheme for patients because it was quite trendy a few years ago to be able to classify people so that we could understand them through research better. And we initially, we started calling this the uh, system-based classification. And the clinical puzzle that you see up here on the left was actually a graphic that was developed for this system-based classification. But no matter how hard we tried to develop a classification scheme, the, uh, the more we found that it failed. We'd, we'd think we'd have it nailed, and then all of a sudden someone would come into the clinic that didn't fit into one of the boxes we'd developed. So at the end of the day, we realized that it's probably not possible to classify people. And I think Gwen Jell summed it up beautifully in her keynote presentation at IFOMT in Quebec in 2012 when she said that there have, for a classification scheme uh, to be accurate, there have to be as many boxes in the scheme as there are individuals in the world. And that's a pretty big classification scheme. So the integrated systems model is not a classification. 
It's a framework. It's a way to help clinicians organize all their knowledge, propositional, non-propositional, and to facilitate wise clinical decisions, to facilitate clinical reasoning on the fly so that they can uh, make the best decision for best treatment. Now, a key feature of this approach, and this isn't unique to the integrated systems model by any means, but uh, a key feature to this approach is something we've called finding the primary driver. So when you have somebody who comes into the clinic and looks like this, you look at them in standing, their primary complaint is urinary incontinence, and you see flat feet, knock knees, hips that are translated, femoral heads that are translated anteriorly, the right one more than the left, so that there's a twist in the pelvis to the left. Alternating thoracic ring shifts, so their rings are going in all sorts of different directions in their thorax. They've got a forward head posture. The head sort of seems to be sitting off to one side. And their shoulder girdles are falling off the top of the chest. And they say to you, I leak. Where do you start? Where do you start? Would you start in the same place if their primary complaint was, I have a headache? or my hands are numb, or I have back pain. Does the symptom drive the assessment sheet you pull out of your drawer? In the integrated systems model, it doesn't, because what we do is something that we call meaningful task analysis. The patient has to choose the task in which the um, symptom they're experiencing gets worse, and then we use that task and do a whole body examination to dry, try to identify the primary place or the key place that when we start to intervene is going to have the biggest impact on function of the rest of the body. So you'll see how this all comes together in, in the case report in a moment. But the message being when there's multiple sites of failed load transfer, and remember failed load transfer means non-optimal ABCs, alignment, biomechanics, and control. Where do you start? When should you treat the pelvis? When should you treat the thorax or the feet? or the cranium for that matter. When do you jump to training the abdominal wall? When should you focus on the pelvic floor? And does it matter? And I think you get the impression that uh, it certainly seems to matter and that you can expedite um, treatment. In other words, you can, you can make things better faster by treating the primary driver. So let me introduce you to Tiana and hopefully all of these concepts will start to fall into place as you understand her story. Uh, Tiana is a 25-year-old nurse. She's not had any children. She's nulliparous. And some weeks pr prior to me seeing her, there was a video that was posted on YouTube. And it was posted by a CrossFit group. Um, and as you know, CrossFit is pretty high-intensity level training. And what it, the message of this video basically was for women that if they were leaking urine during their workouts, that that was a good thing. It meant that they were taking their workouts to the edge. And the message was, you go girl, you leak and just bring your pads to, to work out. And, uh, and that's okay, because that means you're really, really uh, working hard on your core. And I was actually appalled and stunned, as, as most people who work with incontinence um, uh, were. And I posted um, on this site, when somebody alerted it, it, brought it to my attention, I posted that all urinary incontinence should be investigated and not celebrated. And it just so happened that uh, a couple of weeks later, uh, Tiana came in, and I thought this was a very fitting story to capture and to share because she trains in uh, CrossFit five to six times a week. Her intensity level for training is really quite high. Um, she has experienced multiple muscle pulls and strains over the time that she's been doing this training. And most recently, what she's noticed that is concerning her is that she's had an increased awareness of the need to void more often, so urinary frequency and urgency. And most recently, some episodes of stress urinary incontinence during box jumps. So urinary incontinence is her meaningful complaint. She has a fear about, uh, she's a nurse, and so she knows what happens in pregnancy and delivery. And she has a fear that when she does have children, that her con incontinence is going to get worse. And uh, so her meaningful task is box jumps. And so that's the thing we take a look at. So um, what we need to do is find the primary driver for her box jump.
Okay, okay, so up you go. Stay in the squat right there. And then back down. One more time, up and stay in the squat. And back. So your pelvis is rotated to the right in the mm -hmm. transverse plane. Mm -hmm. Your thorax is rotated to the left, so there's a twist between your thorax and your Let's pelvis. Just go down uh, part way into your squat, right there, and then come on back up. This SI joint is giving way as you go down. Go down again, right there, and then come on back up. Whereas on the right side, go down again, it stays pretty stable. When I come up into these lower thoracic rings now, there's 10, 9, 8, there's 7 to the left, and there is 6 to the right. And now when you go down into your squat, come on back up, and again, now, so as soon as you initiate the squat, this seventh ring mm -hmm. goes to the left and the sixth goes to the right, okay? Yeah. So what goes first? Does your sacroiliac joint give way or does the seventh ring shift first? Go slow. There goes seven. There goes the SI joint. Mm -hmm. Go again. There goes your thorax. There goes your pelvis. So that finding sort of suggests that the thorax is driving the unlocking of the pelvis. To confirm that hypothesis, what we would do is we do a pelvic correction, so unwind the twist in your pelvis and give it a little bit of support. Now I see that your thorax gets worse, um, and so I know the alignment has gotten worse. What happens in the task? Go down into your squat, get a sense of what that feels like, versus take the twist out of your thorax, so stack and align these two ring shifts. There we go, and the pelvis unwinds. Your alignment looks a lot better. Relax your shoulders for me, good. And now you go down into your squat. It looks better. See if I can maintain that. Go down again. And it no longer unlocks. So the thorax ring shifts are driving this unlocking in your pelvis. So the pelvis is in a transverse plane rotation to the right and an IPT to the right. Seventh ring still translated to the left. Sixth ring translated to the right. Lift your right leg up off the table for me now and down. And the left one. One leg harder than the other. Left side. Yeah, left side is harder. Okay. If I take the twist stun of the pelvis, there's no change in her thorax. Lift your left leg. Any change? No. No, not a real change in a pelvis. So the pelvis isn't the driver for this task either. So I come up onto the seventh and sixth rings, lift your left leg, and then back down. When I get a really good correction, go again. Much, much easier. And as I correct this seventh ring, I can really feel that the, one of the vectors that is pulling a rib cage into this uh, into this rotation is coming from the external oblique. There's a number of them, but the, the biggest fascicle is the one on the seventh is on the seventh ring. Okay. As I correct the seventh ring, the rotation comes out of her pelvis. If I let the seventh ring go, the twist comes back into her pelvis. What's the impact of this ring shift now on the neuro recruitment strategy for her deep abdominal wall? E-O-I-O-T-A. There's a little more tension on this left side, just even getting into the abdominal wall. Connect your pelvic floor for me. And with whatever she's doing to connect to the pelvic floor, it biases towards her external oblique on the left, and a little bit of TA maybe on the right. I'm not sure, actually, because my brain is just really feeling this EO activation on the left side. If we take the twist out of the thorax, so we need Tiana's help here just to correct that ring. And I can tell she's got a good ring correction because her pelvis unwinds. When I sink into the abdominal wall now, it's much softer on this left side, so she's already dampened down that external oblique. And now connect your pelvic floor. Beautiful, beautiful magic carpet ride. My thumbs are drawn in and up. There's an abdominal hollowing, and it feels much, 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 much better. Well, what about her pelvic floor? Does this, is this seventh ring impacting her ability to recruit her pelvic floor? So 
First of all, my first assessment is usually always with, with an ultrasound and a transabdominal uh, assessment. And if we look here, we first of all do a front back scan uh, with her pelvis in an intrapelvic torsion to the right. And look at the asymmetry of the view. And I'm trying to hold the probe accurately in the midline here. And you can see that there's asymmetry in terms of the position of her uterus, in terms of its relationship to the bladder, when her pelvis is in this twisted position. And when you ask her to lift her pelvic floor, it doesn't seem to be quite in the midline. It's off to one side. There tends to be an asymmetry in the response to this lift. Now, there's many reasons for this, and ultrasound, you can be fooled by a number of things. But as soon as we take the twist on of her pelvis with the seventh ring correction, look at the immediate difference in the location, apparent location of her uterus to her bladder, and look at the difference in the centering of the lift. It's quite different immediately as soon as we take the twist out of her pelvis. Now this is a parasagittal view and, and we don't, it looks pretty normal. We can't see the left-right asymmetry because this is a midline view so you can't see what's happening on the left and or the right side. It doesn't seem to change much with the seventh ring correction. And this picture is just to orient you as to the next view coming up, which is the perineal view. Here we see the anal rectal angle, vagina, bladder. And when uh, Tiana's pelvis is in a twisted position, the trajectory of the lift is quite vertical. It should be forward towards the urethral neck. And when I take the twist out of her pelvis, the tra trajectory changes. And some of this has been shown, or a lot of this has been shown by uh, Ruth Jones and uh, her PhD work. And difficult to see on this clip, um, but you can certainly see and you can certainly feel a difference in the trajectory of the lift um, when the twist is taken out of her pelvis. There also seems to be a bit more support uh, when she coughs in terms of the amplitude of the descent when her pelvis is in a neutral position. So then we follow it up with an internal pelvic floor exam with Tiana's consent. And this is a fairly new tool for me in my toolbox. I just became certified in internal pelvic floor examinations this spring. And um, it's actually been quite an interesting journey over the summer to add this tool to my assessments. Um, and that it's really clarified for me not only this our suspicions that the asymmetry can be driven by twists in the pelvis and twists in, in the thorax, but what I didn't understand before was that not only is there differences in activation, but there can still be an underlying uh, strength deficit. So let, let me explain a little bit uh, more clearly with Tiana. So when she was lying on her back with her knees in a hook lying position, her pelvis was still rotated to the right and twisted to the right, as you saw in the previous video clip. She had an intrapelvic torsion to the right. So in this rotated and twisted position, she could activate the right side of her pelvic floor well, so I could feel a, a lift and a contraction internally, both at the front and the back. However, there was no activation on the left side. It was grade zero. And it wasn't hypertonic. In spite of seeing this elevation on the, uh, on the ultrasound image, this was not hypertonic pelvic floor, which in the past I would have interpreted that as being. So when we took the twist out of her pelvis by stacking her thorax, taking out the seventh ring shift, she could immediately recruit the uh, left side of her pelvic floor much better. It improved from a grade zero to a grade three simply by restoring the pelvis to neutral alignment. However, it was still weaker. It was still only a grade three, which showed that she not only needed alignment training, she needed some strengthening and conditioning training. And this makes total sense. So my hypothesis for Tiana through the lens of the integrated systems model is that she had a seventh thoracic ring-driven pelvic intrapelvic torsion. Lots of words there basically to say her seventh thoracic ring that was being held in a rotated position by increased tone in that left fascicle of the external oblique was causing a compensatory twist in her pelvis. And in addition to that, it was leading to a non-optimal recruitment strategy for both her deep abdominal wall, transversus abdominis, and the left side of her pelvic floor, her left side of her levator ani. Now, because she didn't have control of her TA and her pelvic floor, the hypothesis is, is that she, this led to the unlocking left SI joint in her squat task. 
She had poor thoracic segmental ring control, sixth and seventh thoracic rings, and the sixth ring actually corrected with the seventh thoracic ring. So it was comp compensating for it as well. And finally, her failure to force close and support the urethra was due to all of these things, and particularly during times of high loading. She had enough strength and enough timing to keep the urethra closed during low load tasks, but not during high load tasks. So in treatment, according to the integrated systems model, there's an acronym that uh, is called RACM, R-A-C-M, Release, Align, Connect, and Move. And in order to have um, a good outcome, you need all four components in every treatment session. So the first thing we need to do is to release the non-optimal strategy, release the things that are creating the non-optimal strategy. So for Chiana, it's about doing something for that uh, external oblique, the increased tone on the left external oblique. And then teaching her a new strategy. So teaching her a new way to perform a squat and then ultimately a box jump with her thoracic rings stacked. And if she could learn to control the alignment in her thorax, and at the same time, she could build up the strength and endurance of her pelvic floor, our goal for her was to be able to have a perfect outcome in that she should have, be able to train at a very high level and have no episodes of incontinence and no uh, sensations of the need to void more often than normal. So uh, this is a short video clip that just will illustrate her home exercise program and what I wanted her to do uh, before she did her CrossFit because there is no way she was going to, to stop. Ideally, I would like to have pulled her out of her CrossFit training for a few weeks, but that wasn't going to happen. And uh, so she needed to really be able to integrate this into her training. So let's have a look at what I told her to do. Before you do your CrossFit, this is what I want you to do. And it should only really take you about, I don't know, five minutes or less, less than that, okay? So you're going to lie on your back and just settle in. Go find that seventh ring shift on that left side. Mm -hmm. And correct it. So correct the ring. And then use the breath now to release that external oblique. So breathe sideways into your rib cage. Good. Allowing the rib cage to expand and your belly to soften and to relax to allow that ring to correct. And so over time, you'll need to use less and less and less pressure on that ring to correct it. Okay. Now this time, hold the ring corrected. Good, and inhale, and take your knees off to the right. And that will further lengthen that left external oblique. Exhale to return. Inhale, keep the ring connected. Inhale, open the ribcage, take your knees to the right. Good, and then come on back up. Okay, three to four breaths. Now how do you know that you've been effective at that? Just uh, lift your left knee. Don't correct the ring, but just take the left leg, lift it up. That should get lighter and lighter and lighter. Yeah. Okay? Make yeah. better? Make sense? Yeah. Okay. Now, come on up to standing. Take a step back with your left foot. Spin and plant it parallel to the back of the mat. Make sure that your feet are lined up so that your heel intersects the arch. Good. Bend into your front right knee. Put your right elbow on your thigh. Okay. Now, stick your butt out backwards initially. There we go. Good. Now. Push into the outside of the left back foot. Really anchor that leg, but don't hyperextend the knee. And now think about tucking your right butt cheek, reaching your right sit, sitting bone all the way down towards the floor as you take out that twist in, into the pelvis. Okay, now bring your awareness now to your thorax, to your seventh ring. You can even feel it with your left hand if you want to, put your hand there, great. Now, create some space there and just think about the rings floating apart. So from your waist to your armpits, just grow long. And as you grow long, see if that allows you to reach the right sitting bone down towards the floor a little bit more. Because as you take the twist out of the thorax, the twist starts to come out of the pelvis. Does that make it a bit easier? Yeah. Yeah, cool. So now, as you feel that ring come back into more alignment now, see if you can rotate your chest a little bit more to the left. That's it. Open it up. Good, good. And don't forget, use the breath. On the inhale breath, side body long. Float the space between the sixth and seventh rings. Good. Now let your left arm come up over your head. See if you can find the wall. If not, that's okay. 
push into the wall with your left hand, reach down to the floor with your left leg, and then now into that space, see if you can rotate your chest, you rotate your thorax a little bit more. There it is, there it is. And then just play with wherever it just feels tight. Send your breath there. Three full breaths. And then on the inhale, come on back up to standing. Nice. So that's your release practice, right? The two things you do for release. Now, your, move, your connect and move practice is connecting to that left side of your pelvic floor. We know that when we take correct the rings, that the floor comes on better. But we need to retrain this squat thing, okay? So standing in this dead position, go palpate that seventh ring. Correct that seventh ring in standing. Create some space between the ring. Just let it slot in. Keep that. And now very, very gently connect to your pelvic floor, particularly the left side. So really think about the left side drawing in and up and keeping all that now, just slowly go down into your squat. Beautiful, and then back up. And slowly down in into your squat. So three or four practices of that. Integrate all of that now into your box jump. So just standing in, pre in preparation, side body long. Really think about your rings floating apart. Make a gentle connection to your pelvic floor. Ensure that you can feel the floor has come on in that beautiful symmetric way before you do the jump, okay? Keep all that, don't be bracy, don't be rigid. Just keep that gentle connection and now do your jump. And back down. And this time, see if you can land in the, in the, and stay in the squat for me. Okay. And up you go. And back down. Look at where her center of mass is over her base of support. And this is in one session. Beautiful alignment. Beautiful alignment. Okay? So the take home message from Tiana's story and hopefully from the first part of this lecture for you is that when there are twists in multiple regions of the abdominal canister, the thoracic rings and the pelvic ring, this can lead to non-optimal recruitment strategies which may over time cause pelvic girdle pain, urinary incontinence or urgency, and ultimately over a long time a loss of fascial support for the pelvic organs leading to pelvic organ prolapse. Now, it also, what you see in these patients often, a failure to respond to strength and endurance training because we've really found that when there's twists in the systems, it drives these asymmetric patterns of activation. And you can't, you don't get symmetrical strengthening on left and right sides when you're always in a twist. So this leads to both frustration on the part of the therapist and the patient and ultimately lack of patient compliance. Because in order to strengthen the pelvic floor, the research has shown you need 15 to 20 weeks of strength and endurance training. A lot of this is from the work of Carrie Bow. And, um, but 15 to 20 weeks of contracting a muscle that isn't actually contracting, 15 times zero still gives you zero. So you have to take the twists under the system first and then the strength and endurance training will, um, will start to improve. So our treatment suggestions at the end of the day are don't forget to release and align the entire trunk before you start your training for um, optimal recruitment strategies, rewiring the neural networks, and then start to train for strength and endurance. This is your performance training. And that's the integrated systems model approach to pelvic girdle pain, urinary incontinence, and pelvic organ prolapse. So now what I'd recommend you do is uh, pause this program or this lecture for a moment and have a, have a quick stretch, get a cup of tea or coffee, glass of water. And when we come back, we'll move on into the second part of this lecture, which is to share with you the journey that uh, I've been on that has introduced me to the research world uh, in a very direct way. And that is looking at the diastasis rectus abdominis.